Well, we're hearing a Trump sounding, but it's not the one we're listening for. <laughs> we're listening for the Trump of God. Amen. That's an, not an endorsement of the man running on the other side. That's a... All right. Well, a builder and a pastor and a professional golfer went deer hunting together. They were all novices, but they wanted to try it and see if they could each get a deer. They'd been out all day, and toward dusk, they all spotted a big buck at the same time. They all three took aim. They all three fired at the moving target, and the buck went down. They ran over to see if it was dead, and it was. Then they started to argue about who had actually hit it. I mean, they were going at it. A game warden came along and said, what's the problem? They said, well, all three of us shot this deer, and... Deer went down. We're not sure who shot it. The game warden said, let me give it a look. He knelt down, looked that deer over. After just a couple of minutes, he stood up. He said, it's a pastor. Pastor shot the deer. They said, how do you know? He said, the bullet went in one ear, came out the other. <laughs> I don't know if that's a true story or not. But Hebrews chapter 11 be our starting place tonight. Come, came this week with a number of messages on my heart, but enjoyed hearing our brother read through Hebrews and bring several of the verses we're going to talk about tonight uh, to light and to our attention. Sometimes in the Bible we, we come across words and we just, we just read over them because we think we know what they mean. Uh, in one of my trips through college, I took a course, one of the best courses I ever took in in all the years I was in, in school, I took a course in speed reading. And when I got in that course, the professor said, we're not going to read this entire semester. We're going to learn the definitions of words. And that professor said, the reason you can't read any faster is because your brain shuts down when it hits a word that, that you don't know what the word means. And I, that's all we did that whole semester, just learn words. And when I got saved, it really helped me in, in reading the Bible and studying the Bible, man, when, when, I, when a, my brain would stop at a word, I wouldn't just keep going. I'd go find out what it was. And the Bible says here in Hebrews eleven seventeen, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, in whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, if you don't get the word begotten right, what you just read is not correct. What you just read is not true. See, we, we read through these genealogies and we read so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so. Begat is to father or to give birth to. And we just assume that begotten is some sort of begat type of thing. But Isaac is not the only son Abraham begat. But he is Abraham's only begotten son. Now, let's get this, and then we'll pray, and then we'll talk about Jesus tonight, because we'd, we'd rather talk about Jesus and Abraham any day. Amen. Abraham has two sons. Abraham has the power to make one of his sons his heir. And when Abraham chooses Isaac to be the heir, Isaac is now Abraham's only begotten son. He's not his only son, but he is the son who is chosen by one with power to do so, to fill an exalted or a privileged place. Now the Bible, in half a dozen places or more, calls Jesus Christ God's only begotten Son. Now, wait a minute. The modern versions come to John 3.16. We'll, we'll get John 3.16 a little bit. They come to John 3.16. They say, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. That's not true. Those same modern versions get John 1.12 almost right. To as many as received him, to them gave he, well, they don't get almost right. They say the right to become. They don't say the power to become. But they say to them gave he the right to become his son or sons of God. Well, wait a minute. You can't be a son of God, all of us who are saved, John 1, 12, 
and then get to John 3, 16, and Jesus be his one and only son. But though there are many sons that Jesus Christ is bringing to glory, he is the only begotten son. That is, of all the sons, the angels are sons of God. Adam was a son of God. Everybody that's born again is a son of God. But of all God's sons, he, because he had power to do so, gave one an exalted position and place that he gave to no other. Now, a couple other things by way of introduction. I did not come here to be controversial. But about anything you say nowadays is controversial. First of all, uh, brethren, I, I have no idea what your schedule is for the week. And those of you visiting from their churches, I have no idea what your schedule is for the week. But I'm just telling you right now, three or four people going out one hour every other week to evangelize is, is not even going to come close to getting the job done. The condition this world is in, the condition our churches are in, the lack of spiritual interest in our communities, the fact that we just kind of blow a kiss at visitation and kind of give a, a wink to evangelism, that's, we're doomed. If we're not going to do any more we're doing right now, we're sunk. We, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not comparing, I'm not bragging anything. God's just been good to us. We have five teams of people that go to five different locations to, to preach and minister in public every single week. We have door knocking or evangelism of some sort almost every single day of the week, year round, and we hardly ever see anybody saved. Now, if we do all that, and once every few months, praise God, hallelujah, one person gets saved, you're not going to see anybody get saved sitting in the church practicing Calvinism. Now, you may not believe Calvinism, but a lot of churches don't believe it, practice it. So we've got to get out and do something to reach people. But, but I had to say that to say this. This is 2016. Our soul winning programs, our evangelistic programs, our door knocking programs are still acting like it's 1966. The people you're talking to about Jesus, the only Jesus they know is a cuss word. The people you're talking to about God, they've got a tree God and a woods God and a river God and an and a American Idol God and a movie star God. They don't know who God is. When you open the Bible and show them something out of the Bible, this book has no authority in their life whatsoever. It means nothing to them. You think you're going to show them verses out of a book and they're going to, wow. This book means, means not less to them than a website. So here's what's happening. We are trying to get people to call on the name of the Lord without instructing them as to who the Lord is. And we are trying to get people to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. They don't even have any interest in salvation or see any need for salvation, much less care who the Savior is. I'm telling you, we have, we have got to approach... Fountain City, Knoxville, Knox County, Central Florida, wherever you're from, you have got to assume you just stepped off a plane on a mission field. We talk, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. We talk to people 20, 22, 24 years old in our good old southern small town who have never seen a Bible in their life. Never seen one. We, we have people come visit our church and they're there a couple of weeks, which is amazing, three or four weeks, which is wonderful. They start talking about, I don't want to join the church, I want to be part of something around here. And we tell them, what, you know, y'all living together, you've got to get married. Yeah. They've grown up in church and nobody's ever told them that. Yeah, right. They are, listen, you would say, well, they're living in sin. They don't think they're living in sin. Why would they think they're living in sin? Look, if you didn't, if you didn't go to a church like this, in your life, in your life, not one person ever told you God doesn't want you drinking liquor. That's right. In your life, not one person ever told you you're not supposed to be in the bed with somebody you're not married to. Right. I'm telling you, this is, not a, this is not a Christian nation. This isn't even a nation that remembers Christianity. Right. Right. So when we go out and knock on a door and say, would, would you like to trust Jesus Christ your Savior? They don't know what you're talking about. Now, you can either get them to repeat a prayer to call on an unknown God with nothing in their heart toward him, 
or you can start trying to chip away and say, we tell them, they go out knocking on doors and they come back and say, so-and-so, let us talk to them for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I said, well, next week, don't go anywhere else, go there. Why keep knocking on doors where nobody's interested when you got somebody interested? Keep going back, keep going back, keep going back, as long as they let you go back. Man, I started knocking on doors in 1977, and this is a fact. You go out on the evening and knock on doors Two or three out of every five doors you knocked on, you got in the living room, the TV got turned off, and you had a 30-minute, an hour-long conversation with somebody about Jesus Christ. Uh, my buddy Alfred and I, he would, we would take turns from house to house. One of us would play with the children in the kitchen or the side room while the other one witnessed and gave people the gospel. I'm telling you all this crime and violence and craziness going on now. Nobody's letting you in their house. You might get a conversation on the front porch. So I'm not preaching on evangelism tonight or, and witnessing. What I'm telling you is we need to back way off, not in our efforts, but in our false understanding that we're talking to people who have an understanding. Because here's what I believe. I believe we, we, we get discouraged because we see people saved and baptized and then in a few months they fall away and a few months they disappear. I don't think they ever got saved. Right. And here's why. Because when they found out who Jesus really is, that isn't who they were praying to. And we're trying to get people to call on the Lord, but they're not calling on the Lord. They're calling on a figment of their imagination. This is not political. What I'm about to say is not political. It's not politics. But if, if for a year you tell people, yes, we can, you know what that allows? That allows them to, in their mind, agree with you, and you haven't said anything. This is not political. If, if your slogan is, make America great again, everybody wants America to be great again, thinks you're going to do what they're thinking you're going to do. And when you go to somebody and say, wouldn't you like to go to heaven when you die? Well, of course they would. Okay, repeat after me. <laughs> Fine. And then they come to church and they find out Jesus Christ is some things they're not interested in. And I just don't think we ought to be doing that. Think we ought to be telling people who he is. So anyway, we're going to talk tonight about God's only begotten son. Amen. God's only begotten son. All right, let's pray. Father, help me, please. Help me tell the truth tonight. We've had a great week, great meeting. Uh, Lord, we pray that one more time you'd let us just have our hearts drawn closer to you. I pray you'd help me, Father, to tell the truth in the way that you'd have it told. And I uh, pray you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Psalm number 2. Psalm number two, let's go back there. Psalm number two, this is one that uh, has a little something to do with us, but not much, but it's the starting place. Psalm number two, we've got a passage here that is going to be quoted three times in the New Testament with regard to Jesus Christ. Psalm two, verse six, yet have I set my king, no, 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 let's go back. Um, 2 1, why do the heathen rage? The people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves. See, the Bible's going to back up, help us with the definition. Back it up. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So, look, look, this earth, this earth is full of kings, right? Has been for thousands of years, full of kings who set themselves. Maybe by elections, maybe by wars, maybe by, by birth and lineage, but they put themselves in power. Verse number six, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now you see what that is? That's God, because he has the power to do so, looking past all of these other kings and saying, I'm going to make someone my king. Everybody see that? Okay, verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the innermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. 
That has to do with who's going to sit on the throne of this earth and run everything. Not for, not for a few years until somebody stabs him under the fifth rib. Not until a few years until he drops dead. Not until he goes out to war and loses a battle. Not until he gets voted out after four years or after eight years. This is someone who is going to rule and reign forever because he's not man's choice. He's God's choice. And Jesus Christ has been begotten by God the Father to sit on the throne at Jerusalem and rule as king over all the other kings. Yeah, amen. And it doesn't matter who, who likes that. It doesn't matter who agrees with that. Right. Listen, Jesus Christ is going to come back and rescue the remnant of Israel and establish a kingdom at the end of that nation being horribly punished for seven years for their unbelief. He's not coming back when Israel gets right. He's coming back when the time he said he would come back uh, is, is fulfilled. And when he comes back, you know what he's going to do? He's going to sit on that throne. You say, what do the Arabs think about that? Doesn't matter. What do the Chinese think about that? Doesn't matter. What do the Americans think about that? It doesn't matter. God has begotten. Of all the kings, he chose one and said, you get the throne. Okay, so, so we, you see the definition? It's, it's the same in, in Hebrews 11. It's the same in Psalm number 2. Now watch how this thing is quoted three times of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter number 13. We're headed toward John 3.16, but we can't get there until we follow the road map that God's laid out for us here. Acts 13 you know we're supposed to compare spiritual things with spiritual. We're not supposed to put a verse out there and let it stand as a private interpretation. It's got to fit with all the rest of the scripture. All right, Acts 13. Acts 13. And uh, the Bible says here about Jesus Christ. Verse 23. This man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised up unto Israel a Savior, Jesus Christ. And 28. Though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. Amen. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee, Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead. Now, wait a minute. We just read Psalm number 2. Did, did, did we not just read Psalm number 2? That had nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come on, you read it. There's kings. They don't want God in charge. There's kings. They got plans of their own. But God's going to put his king on the throne at Jerusalem. <laughs> and, then, and then you got a preacher standing up full of the Holy Spirit in Acts 13 who says, well, Psalm number two, that's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, was it or wasn't it? It is in one word. One word. Now, now come on, watch this. Resurrection, resurrection all through here. Th verse 30, raised him from the dead. Verse 33, raised up Jesus' son. Verse 34 is concerning that he raised him up from the dead. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Elijah, by the blessing grace of God, by the power of God, didn't Elijah raise a boy from the dead? Where is he? He's dead. When they buried Elisha, you remember his corpse touched the bones of a man down there in that sepulcher? That man came back to life. Where is he? He's dead. Jesus raised the widow Nain's son. He's dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave. You can't go shake hands with Lazarus. There have been people who have gone into the grave and come out of the grave, but they were not chosen by God to be the resurrection and the life. They were recipients of God's resurrection power, but that power was not in them. That power was not their possession. That power was not one of their attributes. 
Jesus said, destroy this body and in three days I will raise it up again. I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it up again. I am the resurrection and I am the life. Now all of us, praise God, are going to be recipients of resurrection power. But none of us possess resurrection power. Why? Because God chose to place that power in one man. The man Christ Jesus was begotten out of all the men that ever lived. God chose to make Jesus Christ the resurrection. That's, that's important. That's important because they bow down to the bones of Muhammad. That's important because they got a, a causeway. You can walk down and see graves of popes. You can go to historic places of, of Christianity and Protestant and, that, and, and see the graves of some of our great men. And you go to Jerusalem and see an empty tomb. Right. Yeah. Because the one that came out of that grave didn't go back in it. I always thought it was significant when, it, when Jesus walked out of that grave and they went in there to look for him, they found his grave clothes. You know why he didn't keep them? Because he's never going to need them again. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Now listen, J. Iris' daughter could have said, I am she that liveth and was dead, but she couldn't say the next part. See? Lazarus could have said, I am he that liveth and was dead, but he couldn't say the next part. Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He is the only begotten of the Father as touching the resurrection. Now, are you going to die? Then you better know Jesus. Because even some faith healer or miracle worker or earthquake got you out of the grave, you're going back in. Not Jesus. All right, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. I'm glad Jesus Christ is chosen by God the Father to rule and reign on this earth, but that doesn't save my soul. I'm glad God the Father chose Jesus Christ to conquer the grave, to yes. conquer death. Now that's part of the gospel we preach. Christ died for our sins, was buried that third day, rose again, all of that in accord with the scriptures. All right, Hebrews chapter 1, watch this. Bible says in verse 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. So baptism has nothing to do with it. Lord's Supper has nothing to do with it. Church membership has nothing to do with it. Jesus paid it all at the cross. You don't add anything to that. By himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath, look, now look, by inheritance obtained somebody had something to give. That's God the Father. He found someone to whom he would give it. And it wasn't an angel, it wasn't a cherubim, it wasn't seraphim. By, as he, by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, now come on. You, we read Psalm 2, did we not? That had nothing to do with Jesus going back to heaven and sitting down at the right hand of the Father. But the Holy Spirit said it did. So it must, it must be that Psalm 2, while it mentions Jesus being a king, that's not the key there. While it mentioned Jesus conquering these other earthly rulers, that's not the key. The key there in Psalm 2 is begotten. And what we find in Hebrews 1, out of all the people in heaven, God the Father chose one to sit at his right hand. Out of all the people that ever walked this earth, God the Father chose one to sit at his right hand. Now, I'd like to know more about Enoch, wouldn't you? Because he walked with God. He walked with God to such an extent that God just let him walk right on into heaven. 
You talk about one born out of due time. Here's one raptured out of due time. There's a man went up when you weren't supposed to go up. There's a man that got in where, listen, they died back there in the Old Testament. They went to Abraham's bosom and waited for Jesus Christ to shed his blood on the cross. You say, well, how's Enoch fit? I don't know how he fits into anything. He went somewhere where he wasn't supposed to be able to go. That's right. yes. Yes. But when he got there, he didn't sit down at the right hand of the Father. Amen. God sent a chariot of fire down to get Elijah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Joseph, what great, great messages on Joseph. And Joseph, uh, probably a type of Christ more than anybody back there in your Old Testament. But when Joseph died, he just died. They carried his bones around for centuries, <laughs> waiting for the get out of Egypt. When they left Egypt, they said, somebody go get Joseph's bones. They carried Joseph's bones down there and buried him in the promised land. When Elijah, when he finished his course, God sent a chariot of fire down from heaven to pick that man up and carry him up in a whirlwind. Now you can say what you want. I'd like to see that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That'd be that'd be a sight, wouldn't it? You talk about UFO people going crazy, man. That thing hit the internet and, and be all over the world. People say, I saw it, man. I saw it in my own eyes. <laughs> His horses pulling a chariot. <laughs> but it was. And when Elijah got to heaven, he did not sit down on the right hand of God the Father. Jesus said of John the Baptist, of those born of women, there's not been a greater than John the Baptist. That's what he said. And when they killed John in that prison, cut off his head, and that dancing girl gave it to her, to her mother. Yeah. Amen. John wasn't the first man to lose his head over a dancing girl. <laughs> Better be careful. Anyway, when, it, when John the Baptist got to heaven, the greatest man that ever lived. I don't think he even thought about sitting in that seat, but if he had, the father would have said, no, it's not for you. That's for somebody else. When Paul the apostle said, I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. And they, they say he was beheaded. I don't know. When they executed him in that Roman prison, when he got to heaven, he found the seat was already occupied. Yes. I tell you, some of our brethren, they talk about Paul like he's the Savior. Yeah, right. Paul wrote about the Savior. Yes. I, would, I wouldn't glory in the penman. I'd glory in the one he wrote about. Right, amen. I'm telling you, God the Father had a place right there at his right hand. And though, though there's all kinds of, who knows how many angels are up there, how many cherubim, seraphim, heavenly hosts, principalities, powers, all that. I don't know what's up there, but I know this. God had a seat at his right hand of universal authority that he gave to only one person, and that was the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. Thou art my son this day, this day. See? Have I watched you establish that you are the resurrection and the life? This day have I watched you establish that no man comes unto the Father but by you. They want to get to me, they got to get through you. Yeah, right. See, God put Jesus right there. Yeah. All right, one more. Look at Hebrews 5. Hebrews chapter 5. The Bible says in verse number 1, Hebrews 5, 1, For every high priest taken from among men, is ordained for man. You see this? All these men, and you're going to pick one, and you're going to make him something that the others are not. Ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifice for sin, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself... But he that is called of God, even as was Aaron. See it again? Men aren't voting on who the high priest is going to be. They don't fight with swords to see who the high priest is going to be. It was a choice of God to make Aaron the high priest. But Aaron's got a problem. He's got to offer sacrifice for himself because he's a sinner. And you've got to keep replacing Aaron because he's a sinner. He's going to die. And his son will die, and his son's son will die. So, so we got a problem. We have need of a high priest, but they keep dying. And we have need of someone to offer on our behalf, but the person bringing the offering, uh, he's as big a mess as we are. Yeah. Verse 5. So, <laughs> since Aaron wasn't good enough, even though God chose him, 
Just like David wasn't good enough, even though God chose him. Like John the Baptist wasn't good enough, even though God chose him. So, also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Now, come on. You could read Psalm number two every day for a week and you would never see high priestly ministry in Psalm number two. But I'll tell you what you will see, begotten. You will see God choosing because he had the power to do so and God investing in because he had the power to do so some authority, some power, some position that he didn't give to anyone else. And here's what he said. I am going to make this one man the mediator between myself and man. I am going to make this one man ever live to make intercession for my people. I am going to make this one man the advocate to stand in my presence on behalf of my people. Yeah. Now, isn't that an amazing thing? Jesus Christ is chosen by God. He has in his hands, and it's not in anybody else's hands, he has in his hands resurrection life. Nobody else has got it. He has in his hands, and nobody else has it, access to the very presence of the Father. And Jesus Christ has in his hands, and no other hands, the sacrifice acceptable to not only bring us into reconciliation with God, but to keep us reconciled to God. All of that is invested in one man, Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to John 3, 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That, that's ring a little larger to you now than it did 30 minutes ago? That have a little more weight to it now than it did 30 minutes ago? For God so loved the world that he gave the one he chose to be the resurrection and the life. For God so loved the world that he gave the one he chose to ascend and sit at his right hand. For God so loved the world that he gave the one that he chose to be the sacrifice provider and the relationship sustainer. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in, see, not Jesus, whosoever believeth in him, who is that? The only begotten son. You know what we got? We got people all over Knoxville if you ask, are you saved? Yes, I am. Who's your Savior? Jesus. Do you believe he's the only way to heaven? And they'll stutter, they'll stammer, they'll backpedal. They'll say, well, I think other religions. Well, I think as long as you're sincere. Well, you, know what, you know what they're saying? I prayed a prayer to a Jesus, but I never trusted the only begotten Son of God. They don't even know who he is. I'm not trying to talk anybody out of their salvation. I'm trying to make sure that we don't run out of here and, and shake somebody's hand and tell them, don't ever doubt you, what you just did when they have plenty of reason to doubt what they just did. And I want some of you who are saved but are oft shaken in your faith to understand that Jesus Christ, he is far more than the man who died upon the cross. And he's even far more than the man who rose from the dead. He is the one person in this universe that God has empowered to give you life. He is the one person in this universe that God has authorized to let you into heaven. He's the one person in this universe that God has given the authority to keep you saved. That's an amazing thing. I, I am not stating this as a doctrinal fact. 
I am stating this as an observation in 40 years of being a Christian. I am convinced that a person who believes they can lose their salvation does not know what salvation is. Because if you think that what you do today determines whether or not you go to heaven after you have, it, by your testimony, trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't know who He is and you don't know who you are. You are not authorized to keep yourself reconciled to God. You are not authorized to keep your name in a book of life. You are not authorized to maintain a relationship to a holy God. He gave that to one person, Jesus Christ. And if he don't keep you, you're sunk. We, we, somebody come by the church almost every week. I want, I want, I got a, a bone to pick with you. I, I need to argue. You know, I heard you say once saved, always saved. I just don't think that's right. I said, are you saved? And they always say yes. How could anybody honestly believe you could lose your salvation and think they're still saved? You're lying to yourself about your own condition. Come on, it's simple. Two commandments. I don't argue with them. I don't, you don't need 50 verses. Jesus gave two commandments. You, you think you can lose your salvation? Well, I do. Okay. Jesus gave you two commandments. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And you know you don't love me as much as you love you. Nope. Right. That's it. Never mind cussing and drinking and whoremongering and all the rest of it. God gave you two commandments. You can't keep them. That's right. You're right. He gave Adam one. He gave you two. Half of everything God, I mean, you can lie and say you love God with all your heart. You can't lie and say you love me with all your heart. <laughs> I can prove you don't. <laughs> don't take much. Okay, so who saves sinners? The only begotten Son of God. Amen. See, we say, well, I, you know, I, I'm King James, my believer. I wouldn't change the Bible, but we do. We say, if you want to get saved, all you got to do is trust Jesus. That's not what it says. Who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We have reduced Jesus to just another guy selling bagels down in Miami who did some great things a long time ago. We got too many people sitting in our churches who think sincere Jews go to heaven and sincere Roman Catholics go to heaven and sincere Baptists go to heaven and I got baptized as a child, I'm going to heaven and I got... If you don't know that there's only one way of access to God, you have not believed on the only begotten Son of God. Amen. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's, that's who He is. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, let's look at one more thing before we go our way this evening. We're in Him. Are you saved tonight? Yes. You're in Christ. Yes. That's what Scripture says. We're in Christ. Praise the Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Is He the only begotten as touching the resurrection? He is. We saw that. Ephesians chapter number 2. But I'm in Christ. Ephesians 2, verse number 1. And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, quickened is way better than saved. People say, well, I don't like those italicized words in the Bible. They shouldn't be there. Well, Jesus quoted them. You go to that Old Testament, there's, there's verses with italicized words. You go to the New Testament, Jesus quotes words in italics. But you want to leave out the italicized words. Okay, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. <laughs> well, man, don't leave out what he did for me. You hath he quickened. Now, quickened is better than saved. Quickened is better than made alive. Here again, that's what I'm talking about, reading over these words. Quicken is to make alive so as to never die again. How about that? These fingernails, they're dead. They ain't coming back. You can cut them off, you can save them, but they, they, you plant them in the ground, water them, fertilize them. They ain't coming back, they're dead. But down underneath there, it's called the quick. Right. It's alive. Fingernail dies, that thing underneath it keeps on living. We had a boy, uh, he used to live down the street from us, and he, I don't know what term you're allowed to use nowadays, but he had some mental 
problems. And whatever word I say, it's going to offend somebody. So you just plug in whatever, whatever he rode the short bus. Okay, whatever, whatever words you want to say. And he, he'd chew on his fingernails and sometimes he'd go, ah, me bite down to the scream. <laughs> it wasn't the quick, it was the scream. You get down in there, it'll hurt because it's alive. Anyway, so he called it quick. In the Bible, here's what he said. Jesus Christ said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Now, he's the only one without power, but look what he did. When I trusted him as my Savior, he said, come on in here and get inside of me. And in Christ, I am alive forevermore. I am not just raised to walk in newness of life. I am raised to never die again. Yes, the, bo the body, the body is dead indeed because of sin, but the spirit is life. It's quickened. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes, praise then keep on reading. Verse number two, where in time past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others, but God. Hallelujah. Who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And, look at this. Hath raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Look, in Christ. I, I've got no... I got no access to that throne. I've got no right to sit on that throne. But Jesus Christ, not only did he give me everlasting life and place me in himself, he said, why don't you come on up here and stand behind? That's not what he said. Why don't you come up here and stand over there? That's not what he said. He said, why don't you come and sit right here with me at the right hand of the Father? We're not just in heavenly places where Christ sat down on the right hand of the Father, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's amazing. That's amazing. I am one with the only begotten Son. Isn't that something? Now, I've, I've, known, I've known your pastor for a few years now, and, and his mother for a few years now. And if I just showed up at her house and walked in the door and busted in her refrigerator, she'd either call her son or she'd call the cops. But if one of those grandbabies comes in, now I wouldn't crawl up in her lap, but if I did, it'd be weird. <laughs> those, grand, those grandchildren, they'd get right in there. Brother Tim, he told us, that he said, I just had a brand new grandbaby born. That grandbaby, anything it wants, it belongs to Tim, he's got it. And it'll drive his kids crazy. Well, you never did that for me. It's different. Just different. Ice cream, ice cream. Eat your vegetables. Oh, hush. Bring that boy some ice cream. All right, grandkids. They can get the floor dirty. They can leave the door open. They can break stuff. It's okay. It's okay. Come up here, come over here and sit up in Papa's lap. <laughs> come here and sit up in Grandpa's lap. Don't you, don't you let them yell at you. <laughs> but you, could, you couldn't go to somebody's house and do what their grandkids do. Break stuff, get stuff dirty, leave the door open. All that. Isn't that amazing? Look at that kid sitting there in Grandpa's lap. He ain't put one dime into the upkeep of that house. He hadn't mowed one blade of grass in that yard. He, he doesn't pay the light bill. He doesn't wash the windows. He... Grandma loves him. Come here, son. Come here, son. Don't you, don't you listen to them. You're a good boy. <laughs> Mom, he been living like the devil all day long. Oh, you hush. He's a good boy. And there you sit in the lap of Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father, and you had done one thing to deserve even being in the house. You break stuff, you get stuff dirty, you mess things up, you break all the rules. The pastor says, what are you, what are you blessing him for? Why, well, that, that guy, he's the biggest troublemaker I got. Oh, you just hush. <laughs> 
I'm telling you, I am not begotten. I'm born. But I'm in the begotten. And where he lives, I live. And where he sits, I sit. That's pretty amazing. And look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Do you know the Bible says we ought to offer the sacrifice of praise, fruit of our lips, giving thanks to God? You know the Bible says we ought to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto, unto God? Well, how can that be? Didn't he, didn't he make one man? Didn't he beget his only begotten son is the high priest? Right? Just one that God chose. Revelation 1, verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. Is that you? Yeah. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. Is that you? Thank you Lord. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Tim, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You know, there's only one that's holy enough to walk into the presence of God and offer sacrifice, yes. to intercede. You know what the Bible said? We ought to make intercession one for another. Right. Well, how can I do that? I am in the only begotten Son. I'm, I'm alive forevermore. I'm at the right hand of the Father. I get to bring spiritual sacrifices and I get to intercede because I'm in Christ. Isn't that amazing? And it all started in Psalm number two. Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, having to do with the throne. And look at there. He's made us kings and priests unto God. Did you know when Jesus Christ comes back, that banner he's got on says he's king? That's all it needs to say. But it says he's king of kings. Well, he's coming back to, to wipe out the kings. How can he be king of kings? That's the bunch behind him. Yeah. That's not the ones in front of him, it's the ones behind him. You may have heard of me, King James. <laughs> King Andrew, King Timothy. Isn't that a blessing? No, I didn't deserve any of that. Not a bit. God gave it to me. I got a picture, I pull it out every so often. My Man, I'm, I'm so elderly now, my... My son's 33 years old. But we bought this property. We were going we to be farmers, you know, because we knew so much about it. Nothing. <laughs> but in the Bible, you know, they had crops and herds and all that. So we were going to do it, you know, just get close to God and back to nature and back to the land. Hey, there's grocery stores. <laughs> Let the people grow the food that have done it for generations. Don't you try to start. <laughs> anyway. Well, we're going to put up this fence. And I've got this picture. And I'm, I'm carrying this fence post. And I've got my rubber boots on because we bought swampland in Florida. And I've got my hat on. I've got my flannel shirt on. It's one of those cold Florida mornings. It's probably like 60. I mean, it's freezing. <laughs> and I'm carrying that fence post to put it in place. And down at the bottom of that fence post is a little two-year-old boy with his rubber boots on and his flannel shirt on, and his hat on, and he's got his arms wrapped around that fence post. And you know what he's doing? Getting in my way. <laughs> you, you, you started to say helping. He wasn't helping. He was hindering. And there's nothing you would rather do than look down and see someone walking in your, see, your son, your child, Wants to be like you. Wants to. A preacher mentioned it last night. And you know, we stand up in our churches and bless God, I'm serving God. You're in the way. Amen. I want to do something for the Lord. Please don't. <laughs> do you not think he could build his church without your help? Yes, sir. Do you not think he could do a better job of reaching? I mean, he could have just taken the stars and written out the gospel across the sky. It, it, the job been done a lot better. But he lets us do it. And here we are down here. And all we can see is our little tiny arm around the bottom of a fence post. And we say to you, look what I'm doing. I'm working for God. But up there is the one carrying all the load. The one doing all the work. And yet, here I am in Him. I've got resurrection life that He gave me. 
I'm seated right there in the presence of God that he gave me. I get to offer up spiritual sacrifices. I get to praise God. I get to sing to God. I get to glorify God. I get to intercede for you. You get to intercede for me. All because we're in him. He's the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So next time you hear that John 3.16 quoted, next time you're watching a ball game and there's a fellow back there with a John 3.16 sign, he can't wear the rainbow wig anymore because that <laughs> he's still out there with the John 3.16 sign. Just remember, it's not his only son. You're his son. But it's his only begotten son. Yes. Say so one more thing, then we'll pray. Ladies, this modern generation and the modern versions, uh, don't let them get to you. You say, I don't want to be a son. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. It's not, it's not gender. It's not sex. It's... When God gave his word, male heirs, sons, 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 sons of sons, yeah. inherit. You know what God did? He didn't make you his daughter or you'd have no inheritance. He made you a son. It has nothing to do with how you look. <laughs> it has to do with the fact that everything he gave a man, he gave you. Islam doesn't do that. Judaism doesn't do that. Right. The world doesn't do that. Amen. But God, whosoever, listen, whosoever will may come and get everything God has to give you. Yes. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them believe on his name. But he's the only <laughs> begotten son. He's the one God chose to give honor and glory and power and dominion that, he, that no one else is entitled to. But see, I can't say and that no one else will ever have because what the Father gave him, he gave to us. That's amazing. That's amazing. Praise the Lord. All right, Father, thank you. Thank you tonight for letting us get together for a few days and study the Bible. And Lord, we always end up uh, finding your Son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the book to reveal your son. Thank you for giving us your son to save our souls and bless us for all of eternity. And we praise your holy name for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Pastor.